All right, first of all, I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to be here. I love to teach whenever I get an opportunity to teach because we have a unique understanding of the Bible that most of the world does not. And we're very, very blessed to be in that position. By the way, the reason I sit in the far back, if you ever go to like Starbucks, I don't drink coffee, but I drink hot chocolate. If you order hot chocolate or something, tell the girl your name is Mr. Wonderful. And then you get in the far back of the building, and some cute girl calls out your name, Mr. Wonderful, and you can just strut right on up and feel really good about yourself. I'm just saying, it's just something to think about. It needs to more things out. Now, I, I list my name here, by the way, as Clem, because if you don't like the dinner tomorrow, I'm cooking it. Clem, he's the guy you want to talk about. You can gossip about Clem, okay? But anyway, I'm glad to be here. I also have my email up here. Everything I teach is written down and organized. That's just the way I do it. Everybody's got their own style. This is available to you, along with maybe two or three hundred other you know, lessons that you might want to have. Send me your email, ask for any of it, I'll be glad to send it out. I mean, there's literally five or six hundred episodes, uh, episode, lessons that I have that I'll be glad to share with you. I'm in the television business, that's why episodes come up. But this, this evening, I want to talk about something that's very important in the difference between a grace understanding and modern religion. All right? And that is that chastisement and judgment in modern religion has it all wrong. Amen. They use it as a control mechanism. It's designed to make people feel bad. It's designed to make people perform. It's designed to make people jump through the hoops. And in reality, if you understand your position in grace, none of that matters. There's a different motivation. We're going to study that, okay? I've got written down here to fully understand grace and our position in the dispensation of grace. We must look at the areas of chastisement. Many Christians have been taught that God chastises those he loves. How many have heard that one? No, oh, yeah, come on, don't be shy. All right. Or that God lovingly punishes Christians when they get out of order where they should be. How many people spend their lives going, oh, that disaster happened to me because I did this? Or this didn't turn out my business because I did this. They've been taught that. That's the standard, which is wrong. Amen. But that's what everybody knows, okay? Um, while it is easily understandable, this position, it is not scriptural for those who are in the body of Christ. Does God continue to chastise his people in the dispensation of grace? Or is there an even more powerful way to help the believers live for Christ? Let's explore these concepts and a scriptural point of view and see what God has for us today. Because it's not what you were taught. It's not even close to what you were taught. And when you understand that, you will have more power and more joy than anything. Amen. It's as simple as that. What does God want from us? What does the Bible say? Let's take a look. Go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. and start there. you got to have faith first. Let's take a look at that. Are we doing okay audio lines back there? Okay, good. I got the thumbs up. That's great. Clem gets the thumbs up. I feel good. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. That's a good starting point. And that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Our salvation and our relationship to God starts with a belief in God. If you don't have a belief in God, you've got nowhere to go. And if there's people out there today that are wondering, is God for real? Is this a real thing or is this just a, a bunch of religion? It's not a bunch of religion because that's religion. True spirituality is an understanding of your relationship to God. And we're going to go through that today. And if you haven't got that, listen carefully because it's not difficult. You know, Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected. They'll teach you that much in religion. But they kind of stop there. He was risen for our justification. Our justification is because of what he completed. Not what I can do. I'm not saved because of my efforts. I'm not saved because I'm a good guy. I'm not saved because I gave up drugs, alcohol, whatever it might be. There are millions of things that are not healthy for us. But that has nothing to do with my salvation. My salvation comes with the finished work of Christ. If you believe that he did that, if you believe he came and died for your sins, and you accept that as your justification, you're saved. That's it. It's not more complex than that. But the world wants to make it that way. The world wants to make it that way. 
Let's take a look here. Next, we must, we must realize that the members of the body of Christ we are in a uniquely different position than the Old Testament believers or the kingdom age. We're in a different place. How many times do you see pastors get up and go, let's take a look at such and such in the Old Testament, and they read a few verses, and then they turn a whole sermon, you know, a whole ser sermon into that, and it's nothing to do with you whatsoever. Okay? Under the kingdom offer in the Old Testament, God was calling out a special people who would be an example to the world and you enjoy a unique position apart from the rest of the world. That's what that was all about. You had to become a Jew if you were going to get God's best favor back in the day. In the case of the Old Testament, each year the priest would bring a sacrifice to the altar, and this action would cover the sins of the individuals and their family, physically having to do it, killing people, buying the animal, bringing it to the priest, having them cut the throat, the whole nine years, okay? Not eliminate them, but cover them, looking forward to when Christ would take them on Calvary. They did not understand what Christ was all about. But God taught them to do this sacrifice as a means of covering their sins. In the case of the kingdom offer, this is where modern religion, modern Christianity gets very confused. They were to repent or literally change their direction in life toward God and be baptized for the remission of sins. When they did this, they became followers of Christ. We saw that as you started gathering people, living near or with him, having things in common. And the beginning of the kingdom was to be set up on earth. This is why Christ had such a great following. Remember the feeding of the 5,000? With the fishes and the loaves and all those great stories they teach you about? Folks were hanging out with them. They were following him. The kingdom was beginning to be set up. That's what was going on, okay? And it's a significant reason why the Jewish leaders were jealous and afraid of him. He was getting some traction. They didn't like that, okay? And they killed him all. In each of these cases, their separation from the world was a collective or corporate representation of God's lost world. They were not only the way, uh, okay, excuse me, they were the only way to Jehovah, and to be saved, you had to be a Jew or become one, and a chosen one to have access to God. But now, how many times have we heard that? Yeah, what is Paul saying now? But now. It was like this. But now. This is where we are living today, folks, in the but now. We're not in the kingdom age. We're not in the Old Testament. Those are the texts, okay? Today, under the dispensation of grace, everything is very, very different. Um, now, anyone in the world can come to God through faith or belief. Faith in the finished work of Christ. You know, God reconciled the world through Christ on the cross. Whether we participate in it is our choice. But the reconciliation happened, okay? The world has been reconciled if you choose to participate. If you don't participate, you're on the outside. Mm -hmm. You don't get anything. It's a simple process, but it's very difficult because people, what does it do? It takes your ego out of the picture. It's no longer Dave or Clem. Clem did this, or Clem did that, or Clem did this. No. It's what did God do for Clem that matters. Amen. So important to understand that. Yeah. And so many people get it wrong. And where's your eternity? And it's so simple. And they're lost. Anyway. Forgive me for the tears. Anyway. It's what Christ said in the cross. It's no longer a collective or corporate representation of God, but the most intimate, think about this, the most intimate and personal commitment in the individual commit. Amen. Did he not make an intimate commitment to us by dying on the cross for us? Amen. We match that same level of commitment with ourselves accepting it. Letting our ego get out of the way and say, you did it, I accept it. Amen. It's very intimate. No one knows if I'm saved but me. Amen. No one knows if you're saved but you. It's a personal decision you make. It's not a performance. It's not walking the aisle to Jesus. It's not <laughs> repenting to be baptized. Some of you guys relate to that one. To the, you know, through sin, it's none of those things. It is a personal acceptance and commitment that I have through Christ. That's a beautiful place to be. You live in peace all the time when you have that. You no longer wrestle with what the religion of the world tries to pour down your throat. Because they won't. That's what they do. Um, we each make a commitment to it in our own hearts, and no one in the world really knows. Excuse me, I got this. Papers again, available to you. Knows what you believe. We are not judged on our actions for salvation, but once saved, enjoy a changed life in the body of Christ. This is so important to understand. I do not do anything for God out of fear of being punished if I don't. That doesn't even enter my mind. 
What I do for God is because of what he's already done for me. Yeah. Period. Wonderful position. Somebody bring me a clean up. Or was crying to make my nose run. Somebody can bring me one up there anyway. Um, the point is this. I do not do things to win favor. I do things because of what I've already gotten. I always, often use an example. If you have, there you go. If you have um, young children at home, do you want them to keep the living room or their bedroom clean and take care of their toys because if you don't, you're going to punish them? Or do you want them to do it out of respect because of what you've given them? Think about that. That's exactly where we are with Christ. That's exactly where we are with God. But guess what? When you understand that, nobody can control you anymore. You're controlled by understanding your position in Christ. You're controlled by helping others and reaching out to the world. You're controlled by making a difference whenever opportunities arise. Not because you have to. Because you want to. Okay? I love going to a restaurant, seeing an old couple, barely making it, and paying for the bill. And you don't get where it came from. Just pay. And then you leave, you know, they're like, what happened here, you know? They just share the love of Christ. It's fun. It's a wonderful place to be. Um, this is very different than those in the Old Testament or during the offer of the kingdom. No one of God's previous administrations enjoyed our level of intimacy with God. We are in a great place. We are very lucky to be alive where we are in the time frame we are with God in the dispensation of grace. We are in a very different state of position with God than in the past. This, um, <coughs> with this all being said, how does this relate to God's chastisement of the believer? Well, let's take a look at it. Paul's epistles. See that God says about sin and is dealing with it. Take a look at it. How many times is the word chastised used in Paul's teaching? Anybody know? Three. And we're going to explore those three. Okay? The word correct, the word punishment, the word discipline. How many times does that come up in Paul's discipline? Zero. Okay? Go find it. You can. Because that's not the focus. That's not the direction. Okay? The word the world chastisement is used three times in Paul's epistles, twice in reference to unbelievers, okay? And once in reference to Paul's ministry and being persecuted. That's it. That's how they're, they're brought into the picture. Let's take a look at how we are in this world in this position. Got to draw some things. Like pe- people in our church have seen this many times, but I'd like to draw this so you understand our relationship to God. This is the world. God says, you know, you need to live in this area here. He doesn't say you have to. He says, this is smart. In here. What do we do? Oh, yeah, we have to do that here. Oh, let me, let me touch a little bit of this here. Okay. None of us live here where we should be. God tells us, man, don't do that. Do this, do this, help us. And we're like, yeah, I get it, I get it. We end up over here. Guess what? It's not God punishing us when we step out of what we should be in. It's ourselves punishing ourselves. But things don't work out because I'm not living in a world where I need to be living. I'm out here, not to tell the truth of Christ, and out there in the world running around. And I get sick, I get hurt, I get it, whatever it is. It's not God chastising me. It's me hurting myself. Very important to understand that. God sets the parameter. We fail at it. But it's not God punishing us. We hurt ourselves. And when you understand that and can accept that, you begin to see the much different world. It's that religion. Okay? Very important to understand that as we continue on here. Let's see how it all fits together. Number one, we know that outside of the God's God's path, the world is run by Satan. Let's look at some verses here. If we get off of this pathway here, who's in charge? Yeah, and that's a good place to go. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. I'm going to try to slow down a little bit, but i got a lot to say. I always tell my wife, which way would you see her take I always tell her to hold her hand up when I'm speeding along. I never pay attention to it anyway. But I should. She's a lot smarter than me. I have a lot better looking than me, but, you know. It is. Thank you. Right. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world? According to the prince of the power of the air, who's running the world? Yes, indeed. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's the world. That's the world we come out of. When we accept the finished work of Christ, 
we no longer have to participate. Are we going to participate? Yeah. It feels good, Pastor. Pastor said, it looks good, you know I me, mean? let's do it. You're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna do it over and over and over again, but we don't have to. We have a choice now. We understand the difference. How many people can honestly say, I was gonna sing once and I stopped myself. I'm not, I'm, I'm not putting my hand up. Because you know what? I'm sure it has never happened to me that I could think of. Excuse me, constantly cleansed. Anybody got that done? But the reality is, we know better, we choose not to. All right? And what happens, whatever the consequences that are, are brought on by us, not God. God doesn't chase us. He doesn't chastise us and say, oh, Dave, you fool. Boom, boom, boom. You didn't have to. Dave's already out there being a fool. Okay? He's put me in a different position. Let's go to Titus chapter 2, verses 2 through 14. <coughs> this is how Paul teaches us to be. This is how we should operate in the world. This is not religion, folks. This is not the, what, the Beatitudes or whatever it is in Matthew and all sorts of crazy stuff they teach you. This is not that. Because it doesn't apply to you. If you try to apply it to yourself, you're going to be totally wrong. And I honestly believe that if you try to apply Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John into your life, you probably are not saved. You do not understand your position in Christ. You understand religion that was taught you, and you're probably lost. It's not that I don't think some people can be saved at the end that it's possibly true. I'm not passing judgment. But I think to me it would be very hard to be saved if I'm not understanding the, the, the dispensation of grace with Paul. That's where the message comes from. How can they say, oh, you have to have Jesus on the cross and be saved for your sins, etc., etc.? That all comes from Paul. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all those guys talk about that because they didn't understand it. Because it wasn't part of their time. Paul talks about those things. Yet they say Paul was just a great missionary. He did a bunch of missionary trips and he was really good at it. Did they not? I mean, just go up the internet, find that. That's what they'll tell you all about them, okay? Let's go to Titus chapter 2, verse 2 through 14. That the aged man be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. I love those things, guys. What do you think? Sound in faith? I kind of hope I have that. Temperate? Yeah, maybe. Charity? Yeah, okay. Patience? Never. <laughs> Patience, I am off the rail. Okay? I mean, today we went to the IHOP, and it took like 45 minutes to get some scrambled eggs and bacon. Okay? And then we ordered some food for, for Trish. When we got our food, we ordered some for her to bring back, and that was another 40 minutes. I mean, bacon and eggs, I can whip that up at home in about two and a half minutes. It was amazing. Patience, not for me, sorry. I tried, but it's not there. The aged women, likewise, that they be in, that they be in behavior as become of holiness, not false accusers, not giving too much wine, teachers of good things. I'm not going to touch that, ladies. You guys know your act. <laughs> that they may teach the other young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, and that the word of God not be blasphemed. Young men, likewise, exhort. Be sober-minded. He lays all this stuff out for them because it makes sense to live this way. This isn't a program where you've got to do this or else. This is a program, here's some wise ideas. Here's some wise things to live by because you're going to enjoy life better. None of us were young and crazy, I know that, okay? I certainly was. My lovely wife was. We have great stories <laughs> of being young and crazy. But you know what? There was no, there was no joy in my job. As crazy as we were, and all the things we did, and all the parties, and all the things, no joy. I go to bed every night, and I'm at peace with my Creator. I have joy 24-7 because of my position in Christ. Because I don't fear the retribution of God, I instead re receive the love of Christ and give that to the world. That's my motivation. I don't fear anything. I probably should. In business, sometimes it makes some pretty poor decisions. But the reality is this. Well, I think my eternity is fixed. I'm 65. I had open heart surgery a couple years ago. Never even thought about that. I didn't even occur to me. Because you know what? My eternity is in great state. I'm 65. If I live another 20 years, it's going to be amazing with my body that I get that far. But you know what? After that, I've got an eternity with Christ. What do I have to look forward to? Amazing. And I don't live in a fear of God because I don't understand my relationship with God. We're very lucky in this room. Most of you, and I hope everybody in this room is saved. 
For most people in this room, we live in a life relationship with God that's joy, filled with joy, filled with wonderful things. Not fearful, not wondering, not, not understanding where we're not going. I see people like that all the time. And this is, we can talk in religion a little bit here and there. We can talk about spirituality, we can talk about Christianity. <coughs> and 75, 80% of the time, these folks are living under some kind of grief. They're living under some kind of conviction of something that they were or did. But they did when they were young. Oh my God, I can't tell you how that is. You know what I mean? We do things in our lives that aren't perfect, that aren't right. But if we're in Christ, God doesn't even see them. How can you see anything I do if I am in Christ? I am perfected. Amen. He doesn't see sin. He sees what? I, I, I have Jesus' sunglasses, okay? I'm looking through Christ. I'm perfect. When I understand that, when I fail, when I make mistakes, I don't spend my time going, oh, it was terrible. I got to do this now. I feel terrible. And the next week I'm going to feel bad. I'm like, no. I go, Lord, I was wrong. This is wrong. I actually, you know, I, I let him know I, I was aware of what I did. I'm not asking for forgiveness. That doesn't happen. But I'm going to say, I understand what I did. And I'm going to move on. I'm not going to let the sin or the failure hold me back from sharing the love of Christ. Mm-hmm. That's hard for people to do. Especially if you grew up with parents that judged everything. Why did you do that? Like, why are you doing this to me? You know, I didn't have parents like that, fortunately. All right? So life is joy when you're in Christ. It is not fear. And I have no idea. What, who first was I on? Anybody remember where we ended up in here? No. Um, uh, seven. I think we're at seven. In all things, showing ourselves a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing a corrupt, corruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. Okay, who's good? Who's, who's, who's guilty or not guilty? Who does that? Okay, that's the thing that I say that I'm good sound speech. Especially if I stub my toe or bang my head or something. Then I have stuff that's not going to go down at all, okay? But you know what? I'm still human. And you know what? I understand my position in Christ. And most importantly, I am saved by the faith of Christ. What he went through so that I could have salvation. Okay? Let's, let's, put the, let's put the focus where it needs to be. It's Christ's faithfulness that allows me to believe in what he did. Okay? Is that my ego? No, it's God. It's God. Always goes back to God. Always goes back to Christ. Okay? Uh, that, um, that, let me see, that he, that is of the contrary uh, part, may be shamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Hmm. No evil thing to say of you. I'm sure there's some folks that don't like me. No, they don't like Clem. They stay. The Clem gets kicked to the curb. All right, here we go. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own master and please them in all things, not answering again. Not for learning but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. For the grace of God, here we go, verse 11, this is when everybody's memorized. We all think so? Somebody get shot? Okay. Uh, verse 11, this is one that I know I studied. Anybody, anybody give me a WANA program when you were a kid? Yeah, a couple of us, Chicago work. Well, when I was big in Chicago, you met. I did that, okay? This is a verse I learned. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That is a wonderful thing to be in. in. Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a particular people. What is this last part? Zealous, yeah, yeah. Zealous of good works. You know, I'll, I, everybody here probably bought a lottery ticket when it was at two billion dollars. Did we not? I mean, I bought ten of them, okay. And I was going to win that lottery, and Trish was going to run the company for my wife and I, and we were going to pour all this money into the community and get people homes and all sorts of cool stuff. I was going to do some great stuff with that money. I really was. We planned it all out. I didn't win, but anyway, we planned it all out. Obviously, that. The point is, zealous of good things. Opportunities are all around us. Help each other. A co-worker who needs help. A co-worker who's having a difficult time because their child's gotten hurt or their husband left them or whatever. Opportunities to share the love of Christ. You have to lead with sharing the love of Christ if you're going to lead anybody to salvation. If you don't lead with the sharing the love of Christ, you're just another religious player on the street block preaching away. When they see your good works, they'll open their heart to learn more. That's how it works. And sometimes it takes a long time, years, 
you do anything for somebody for you? They finally one day they go, why do you do this? And I'll say, do you really want to know? I'll make them commit to it. And they'll share. Okay? I've led people to the gospel, to, to, to salvation, years after knowing them. I had a babysitter one time who I shared you know, salvation with numbers of times. And it was like 10 years later, she said, why don't you talk to me about it made sense? I finally got it. I finally saw it. Because she'd be going to a Baptist church. You can hear all this confusing stuff. And she kept remembering what Dave had told her. Her son had told her. And it finally stopped. So you never know. You plant the seed. You go out there and share the love of Christ. And if they want to know more, I have a client, Baptist, uh, excuse me, Bush Hall. Are you familiar with those guys? I like the big cutters. Okay? Very, very religious company, actually. They pray before meetings. We go to uh, trade shows and stuff. We all get around and they pray. They let me pray now. Because I don't pray about selling more bush hogs. I pray that we can share the love of Christ with others. I pray that other people don't get hurt running into our booth because there's all this chunks of metal around. My focus is different. They said, oh, we like that focus. Well, let me tell you some more. Opportunities open up at that point. That's how it works. That's what life's all about, okay? It's very important. Are we doing a pay time wise? I have no idea. She's back there. And I'll take all night. Ten minutes. Oh, my God. I'm going to get busy here. No problem. That's it. Yeah, come back this way. It's very important that we live godly lives as an example to the world and to enjoy all that God has for us in the service. Okay? As radical as this seems, it is the cornerstone to our position in grace. Okay? To give back to God. Think about it for a minute. How can any sin, past, present, or future, be in the body of Christ? Remember what propitiation means, as if the sin never existed in the first place. Okay? Paul teaches us, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are expedient. What is he talking about here? He's saying, Dave, you can sin all you want, but it's not a smart move. You're not going to have Okay? It's not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. This is our position in Christ. All sins, past, present, and future, all the sins are forgiven, all things are lawful, but all things are not healthy. That's the thing. You want to talk about chastisement? There is no chastisement. There is unhealthy lifestyle that I can pull up and do all I want. And I can be pretty miserable about doing it. Okay? Um, let's look at Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Let's not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man be a stumbling block for the occasion to fall in his brother's way. Okay? We don't need to do things that are going to make people uncomfortable. <laughs> For no, I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ, there is nothing unclean, this verse 14 itself, but to him that seemeth anything to be unclean, to him is unclean. How wide is your road of grace? I say this because people are like, oh, salvation by faith is the finished word of Christ, but if you're not in this range, if you're over here, I can't talk to you. Uh, how wide is your road of grace? God's road of, road of grace is wide. As wide as it gets, we tend to be judgmental. We tend to be going, oh, let's get like that again. That's not what we want to do. If we don't reflect the love of Christ back to the world, no one else is going to. They're not going to get it from the Catholic Church. They're not going to get it from the Baptist Church. They're going to get a lot of mumbo jumbo, and they're going to get a lot of control. They're going to get a lot of uh, chastisement. They're going to get a lot of uh, worry and fear. But you're not going to get the love of Christ. Okay? Verse 19 says, Let us therefore follow after things which make for peace, things wherein one may edify one another. I have in capitals here, love is far stronger than fear and punishment as a motivation for godly life. Not just that, okay? Romans chapter 8, verse 14 through 16. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Are you there? Ask yourself, have I accepted the finished work? For it's so difficult for people to come out of religion and understand that it's just accepting. It's not coming and walking out of Jesus or performing or doing this or doing that. Oh, wait a minute. Hiding. Hmm. Can you get that money call? Okay? You guys are laughing, but boy, there are people who live under serious hiding conviction. It has nothing to do with their salvation. Okay? Verse 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. You feel that way? Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. 
Are you there? In your hearts, are you a child of God? Then let's be focused in the right place and not spend our time living a miserable life out of fear. If anybody here wants to talk more about this or send me an email, we'll talk about it. I'd love to share it with you because it's important to understand this. It'll change the way you look at the world. It'll change the way you react to the world. It will eliminate the fear that's in the world that you live with all the time. But what if this doesn't work out? What if that? We were taught that by our parents. How can we be? We don't have to worry and fear and be concerned. We have to live for God. When you mess up, and God knows I'm 65, I've had at least three sins in the past that I can remember. No. <laughs> the reality is plenty. Plenty, plenty, plenty. If I spent my time focused on the, the misery I've caused and things and situations, what have you, I'll share this with you. Young man, we're all kind of crazy when we were young. This young lady I was with, along with some other people who were with her, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, she got pregnant. And she gave up the child for adoption, literally the day after he was born. So none of us got a chance to see this kid to see if it was ours or not. We were all wondering. Well, my daughter, years and years and years later, does 23 Me, bingo, shows up, she's got a brother. So we were able to reconnect. I don't look at that and feel bad about it. It was what it was. I now want to share with him my relationship to Christ. Okay? The opportunity to do that. Give up those past sins that are burdening you, that you're weighed down with, that you're, you're feeling miserable about, that you can't move past and let them go. God doesn't see them. He doesn't want you to spend time with them. Satan wants you to spend time with them. He loves it when you wallow in your, in your, your mistakes. Amen. He's all about that, boy. Let's just spend some time doing that. Because guess what? When you're wallowing in your mistakes, you're not able to share the love of Christ. You're fearful to talk about it. And then you're going to go, if you share the love of Christ and try to explain salvation, they go, yeah, but look at you. You did this. That's a great opportunity to say, but God took care of it. Okay? I'm not proud of my mistakes, but God took care of them. I failed many ways, but God took care of them. And I can go to bed at night and feel at peace with my Creator because of my relationship to Christ. It's really that simple. It's not complicated, yet people make it complicated, and religion makes it extra and doubly complicated. Walk the aisle for Jesus. That was, that's a southern thing out in the north. A man that walked the aisle for Jesus down here a lot. That's a big thing. Okay? You've got to be repentant and get baptized. You, got to, you can't get baptized by sprinkling. You've got to go under the water, and it's got to be in a river that's flowing. I mean, hey, all these conditions in that bird means nothing. There's no salvation in baptism. The salvation is accepting, accepting, accepting what Christ did. Which is very hard sometimes. Because your ego is no longer involved. There's nothing Dave can do. There's nothing Dave has any value in. It is all God's value. It is all what he did. And that's the way to be. And there's joy in that. And there's peace in that. I see a lot of bobbing heads and that's a wonderful thing. Because that's what it's all about. Let me close with my two favorite verses. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is how we are to look at the world. All right? Let's get over that. These are my two favorites, as the pastor said. These are David's favorite verses. There. Starting so chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your body the living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. What did it say? Which is your reasonable service. He's saying, look what God has done for you. It's reasonable for you to give that back. It makes sense to give that back. If somebody did this gift to you, you'd give it back. It's reasonable. It's not some outlandish thing. It's a reasonable thing to do. Look at the next verse. And be not conformed to this world, because it's easy to do that. I've been there and done that. I have all the t-shirts and many of them. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. <coughs> studying, understanding, and growing. The more you know, the more you can renew your mind. Then you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Amen. It is that simple. Don't make it complex. Don't let religion get in the way. Don't let, don't let chastisement that you grew up with through your family, your faith, and other places stop you from accepting the finished work of Christ. And when you accept this, <coughs> Take a deep breath and move on. And move on. Remember when you accepted Christ, the peace that soaked through your body finally? And you were like, oh my God, this is great. Well, that's what you get. 
Don't lose that back in religion. Don't lose that back with I should have, could have, would have, oh my God. Don't spend that time, okay? And if anybody needs to know more, I'd be glad to be around here. I have a book out there in the counter that's free. If you want one, get one. It's a simple explanation of the dispensation of grace and our faith in Christ. And where it is and why it's there. It's important you understand that. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to reach out to other people, to make a difference in this world. We thank you for the knowledge we get at these conferences and other places in our churches that we can then use to make that difference in the world. Because the more we know, the more we can share. The more we know, the more we can share, the more we love. The more love we can share, the more the impact has. It's about reaching others for Christ, getting that last person in the mix so we get the rapture going here. You know, let's get that happening. But we thank you for those opportunities. Give each of us an opportunity this week to share the love of Christ in some way. And if they want to know more, help us to find the right words to make it smooth and help others understand as well. In your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dave. Enjoyed it. Uh, I, I do want to, we're going to take a break, guys, but I, I want to reiterate something. Bring it up in here. You know, we come to conferences, and, and I've watched this over and over for the last, since 2000, at the conferences that I've been going to. We come in and we come with one or two people, or maybe by yourself, and that's who you hang around with. Get out, and this is a fellowship conference. Meet somebody new. We've got probably a third of this group from Baton Rouge. I mean, they'll probably be congregating together. But at the same time, we got people from Las Vegas. Katie, where are you at? There you are. She's in the back. She flew in from Las Vegas. And we'll talk more about her as the night goes on. But, but the thing of it is, meet some new people. We've got preachers in here that's never been here before. Brian and... My, jet, my, my clay here, my individual here sitting here, and uh, I know you guys don't know me or them. Get to know each other. Now that's just what I'm going to suggest. Oh, Freddie here, I ain't seen him in many years. Get to know him. He's a banjo picker, a bluegrass picker, and he's a saved individual. That's the good thing. Okay? So let's take a break. Come back at uh, 7 o'clock. Good.